Hi, I'm Tom Witherspoon. I am a, uh, a structural and a geotechnical engineer. I'm actually a uh, diplomate as a geotechnical engineer recognized by the, the Geo Institute and by the Structural Engineering Certification Board, I am a structural engineer. I also uh, owned a foundation drilling company and ran that for over 22 years and uh, S&W Foundation and did a lot of limited access drilling and things that were considered to be impossible. So I'm going to talk to you a bit uh, about uh, geotechnical engineering. And geotechnical engineering is is basically, I call it from the ground down. It is evaluating everything in the subsurface to provide factors, design factors for a structural engineer to design the foundation for that uh, structure. Uh, in any kind of ge geotechnical engineering uh, study or analysis includes establishing a water table determining the swell potential for the underlying stratum and especially in expansive soil areas, developing the soil parameters that determine the depth and termination stratum for a drill pier or an auger carrier's pile. Um, when available, soil borings will penetrate into suitable rock formation to provide the axial compressive capacity of the drill piers or the auger cast piles. And this analysis must include the bearing capacity at the base, the skin friction that improves the axial capacity of the underpinning, and expansive clay environments develop skin friction uh, to uh, analysis to prevent upheaval of the underpinning. These factors must also establish reinforcing steel requirements for the shafts, and the geotechnical factors such as skin friction will provide the structural engineer with all of the, the data that he needs to establish the foundation statistics. When applicable, the geotech must establish a lateral soil and rock pressures on the underpinning so that the structural engineer will be able to establish shaft diameter and reinforcing requirements to resist the lateral move, movement. In some cases, there'll be a necessity to intersect faults or fissures in the rock formation, and the geotech must provide the necessary lateral or sliding pressure to stabilize a hillside. And I, in practice, have seen that on various situations. In remedial situations, there may be a need to install haunches to distribute loading from the existing structure to the pier or pile, and the geotechnical factors will establish that. In the case of retaining walls, a geotechnical engineer must establish lateral loading factors, which will uh, determine the type of reinforcing, retaining wall that is most appropriate for the site. These walls can be gravity, which includes gabion, stone gravity, or reinforced concrete. They can be cantilever reinforced uh, concrete retaining walls or an MSE, which is a mechanically stabilized earth wall, or a drill pier supported wall, such as exist along creeks or rivers. And I design a lot of those because they're important to resist the lateral movement, and I've seen failure of a lot of these other types. Um, this all ties back to the geotechnical report. In the words of Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. A lot of times uh, clients will not spend the money on a geotechnical report because they want to save this $1,500 to $3,000 and it ends up costing them a lot more in the end. Not having the proper geotechnical study was a Brook River parking garage and this this occurred back in 1985. Uh, they realized that, that the uh, inverted tees on these piers at that parking garage right here in Dallas, that they were settling. And they finally came in and ge did a geotechnical study. And the geotechnical study that there was trash and debris and everything down below the sur surface 
that no one checked out. They just came in there and drilled some piers 15 foot deep and there was, you know, over a period of time in, in that environment because it was a trash dump in Dallas, they started settling because they didn't have soil borings and geotechnical studies of that area ended up costing them $350,000 because of the remedial work that had to be done. And, and there are several other examples that I have witnessed in my career, both as a contractor and as a uh, geotechnical engineer. And in most cases, they, they don't want to spend the money for the geotechnical study, and they end up paying for it in the end. But the geotechnical study is it's very important. I mean, we're not in a, a high earthquake area in the Dallas area. But in Oklahoma, there's some earthquakes that there and the geotechnical studies are so important to establish the cracks, the fissures, and the faults in that rock because if they're not intersected with the drill piers, then that building or structure is going to move. And so all of this is extremely important to establish the geotechnical parameters so that the structural engineer can properly design the uh, foundation for that structure. A good, a proper geotechnical study would have established how bad the soil conditions were so that it's not just putting piers and isolating it, but establishing a treatment for the expansive soil. And one thing that's extremely effective, and Marshall Addison did studies for his PhD dissertation at UTA, showing that potassium chloride and water, which is oil field technology, Johnson and Johnson engineers, the husband and wife did all kinds of studies on that and found that, that uh, potassium chloride in water would make an ion exchange with the clay and would stabilize it. Well, the way to do that is, is not only uh, doing a study before you start to know how you treat the soil, but doing one after you treat it to establish it's correct. The uh, Collin County Appraisal Office, they did not do a proper geotechnical study. They had an engineer that thought he knew the area and he drilled piers down about 15 foot and, uh, and they were socked into Austin Chalk. But in that location, had they done a geotechnical study, it would have shown that the Austin Chalk had swell potential. So they ended up with heaving all under the Collin County Appraisal District. And it, it, was an, it was an interesting thing, me getting involved, because they had one engineering firm that said you had to tear the building down. They had another engineering firm working for the builder that said, oh, no, this is just normal movement. There's no problem. You know, don't look here. And uh, they brought me in literally under the cover of night. The, uh, in, the uh, attorney that hired me had me go to that appraisal office by myself with my instruments and everything at 6 p.m. on a Friday evening. And I had to go in and completely draw up the building, do an elevation survey, show all exactly what was wrong with it, and then do, as a geotech, doing proper soil uh, borings and studies established what additional swell potential there was in that building. And I established a program of going through, drilling five foot on center in that entire building and injecting potassium chloride in water down 10 foot to stabilize the clays. But I didn't just take what I thought it was doing came back afterward, we'd inject an area and did soil borings to establish, yes, it had reduced the swell potential to below 1%. So it was two geotechnical studies. Uh, I think the remediation of that building ended up being like a half million dollars, but it was done properly and I have done um, go back inspections and the building has settled out and everything is good. There were some areas that were so bad they had to be peered, excavated, and lowered 
because of the swelling there. And there were pockets that were extreme, extremely bad. But uh, I've got, I, I, I'm very blessed to have the, the uh, experiences that I've had as an engineer and as a contractor. Because as a contractor, you got to make this work. As an engineer, you can come up with all these theories, but it has to be workable. And, and mine were workable. As, as a geotech, um, you look at all the factors. There are certain tests and everything you do uh, in your laboratory to establish this. You do a soil boring, you're taking samples every five foot all the way down to the depth that you have to go. A lot of times clients will want to save money by only doing a 15 foot deep soil boring. I think that they need to be deeper than that because if you haven't encountered rock, you probably should find out where the rock is to establish what, uh, whether it's going to be economical to develop here or to sock it into rock. If you've got rock reasonably close, then you want to sock it into rock. But some of the swell potential, there is potential vertical rise. There are tests for that. There's soil suction tests that can be done that will establish the volatility of that soil. And a lot of it is tied into the plasticity index. And the plasticity index is a factor that tells you swell potential of that soil. And any, in, in doing a geotechnical study, it, it, is, it varies from the time of year. Because if you're doing a geotechnical study during the rainy season, then you're not going to have much swell, swell potential in that upper 10 foot. But if you're doing it during a dry season, then you're going to have enormous uh, swell potential in an expansive soil area. So the geotech has to not only look at what is the, soil, the swell potential now, but if this little soil dries, what is the swell potential when it dries? Because all of that is important. Now there's other areas, there's expansive clay areas in Virginia, there's expansive clay areas in various pockets around the country. There's also in the Northeast, there's, uh, there were glaciers some time ago that came in down from Canada pushing all this rock formation down. And now they go in to build on top of it and you've got a varying condition that they have to do the geotechnical study to establish all those soil parameters because you have various uh, pieces of igneous formation that have come down with those glaciers and it's, it's a whole different environment there. Um, and it, it's something that has to, has to be evaluated by a geotech that is competent to go through and establish depths. And those are sometimes fairly deep because of all the, the uh, glacier deposits that were brought in. A geotech in their geotechnical study will establish soil parameters, but they'll also provide recommendations. They will say if you're building a slab on grade, you have a potential vertical rise of, of uh, so many inches so that the, the builder w can decide whether he needs to do some kind of soil treatment. Uh, there's also pockets in uh, Nevada of karst. And karst, when it receives water, will, will just completely deteriorate and it causes a problem. And so you have to also, the geotechnical studies, there's different soil parameters around this nation and, and in other countries that you have to establish exactly what the soil parameters are and the geotech will lay out if, if a slab on grade, you need to expect this. Uh, they will, in, in some areas, they'll establish, well, there's karst here. Uh, you're going to have to deal with that. Uh, but, but they will establish certain specifications to give the structural engineer additional information to do his design. And when, when you're doing, uh, when you're establishing a foundation, and, and the engineer establishes, the geotech normally will say this, 
this probably this structure probably should receive piers and uh, but the final decision is going to be the structural engineer's decision but whether it's drill shafts or auger cast piles that's considered underpinning you're underpinning that foundation because you're going to have a concrete foundation with grade beams and slab and in most cases it's a good idea to put piers or piles under that foundation to support it and that the piers will only prevent settlement they cannot prevent upheaval which is the reason the geotech has to establish whether soil treatments are needed for that site this video was made courtesy of peer research the standard of excellence manufacturer of high quality alignment and centralizer products for the deep foundation and earth retention industries